<coughs> okay, so now I want to uh, talk about some applications of <coughs> what we've done. Uh, so, the, I mean, somehow the point of geometric group theory is to to have uh, topology and geometry give you the tools to study groups. And so, but ultimately, you, you do want to answer some questions about about out of n um, by by looking at these pictures. And so, what are some sample questions? I mean, you can like what uh, so the sample questions that we'll try to answer. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll just uh, so how, how how big can a finite subgroup be? So about about out of n. How big can a finite subgroup be? I don't actually know the answer in the sense of uh, you know precise number, but there it's it's finite. That's somehow what I'll try to show. And, and there is some, some explicit upper bound. Um, how big can a free abelian subgroup be? In other words, what's the largest R? So that Z to the R is a subgroup of other fan. Right? That's one question. Um, uh, so in general, what can you say about subgroups? Like, uh, so uh, are there any exotic subgroups? Now this one, this one is vaguely stated, but uh, what I have in mind is some, so there's something called the Tietz alternative here. Uh, we, we won't really discuss this, but the, the following tr turns out to be true: that uh, every subgroup is every subgroup of out of n either contains a free group, a non-abelian free group. Or is uh, um, what's called virtually abelian. This word "virtually" refers to finite index subgroup. So a group, a group is virtually abelian if it has a finite index subgroup which is abelian. It's virtually solvable if it has a finite index subgroup that's solvable. Okay. So somehow in geometric group theory, we don't we don't really um, care so much about you know. Exact property, but we're, we're happy if we can find if we can pass the subgroup of finite index and achieve this property. Passing the subgroups of finite index is usually allowed in in geometric group theory. Okay, so I'll tr I'll try to discuss some of these questions from the point of view of these uh, spaces, and, and and we'll need some more uh, statements. But um, but anyway, that's where we're going. <coughs> okay, just uh, just to to. Relate to yesterday's uh, lecture, I'm, I want to state the following proposition: that CVN is path connected. Okay, so in fact it's contractible, but we we won't prove contractibility. Okay, contractibility is harder, but wh why is it why is it um, path connected? So any. Uh, any point in CVN can be connected by a path to a rose. Right? That's sort of by definition. I mean, wherever you are, you just collapse some edges and you get down two rows. And we only need to um, show that any two roses can be connected by a path. To show any rows can be connected by a path to R. R where R is uh, our standard rows, the one with the identity marking. So that's sitting somewhere in, in outer space. Okay? So any rows gamma. Okay, so this, this is uh, going to be done like yesterday. You're using folding paths. Folding paths are going to be promoted to paths in outer space. So uh, folding, st st the fo process of folding can be interpreted as paths in outer space. Okay, this is how you move around outer space using folding, and that, that's what this proposition somehow tells you. Okay, so <clears throat> so um, 
So fix a morphism. So this is now back to morphisms from yesterday. Um, gamma to R representing the inverse marking. Inverse marking of gamma. I guess I'm, from, I'm removing the marking from the notation. I'm thinking of gamma as being some point in outer space, but secretly there is marking here. And then, and then I want to connect it to, the, to my rows. <coughs> so I, I, can, I can fix the uh, amorphism that represents inverse marking just like we did yesterday, right? When we had an automorphism and we're representing it by, by amorphism. OK, now uh, factor into folds. as usual. So we have um, gamma is gamma 0, goes to gamma 1, gamma k, and then, and then this last one is a homeomorphism. OK, so now the point is that uh, a fold from gamma i, so, every, so first of all, every, every gamma i Every gamma i can be viewed as a point in CBN. So gamma i will look like this. I mean, it'll it'll have a I don't know. It'll be it'll be some kind of a graph, and it might have it might have trees at the end. We didn't do any examples of that, but as you fold, you could conceivably, um, you know, if you have a a picture like this somewhere in your graph, and maybe all edges, outgoing edges, are labeled the same way. Then, and when you fold, you're going to end up with a, you know, I don't know, like this. Well, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, you might, you might end up with a picture like this. So there might be some trees sticking out. But just remove that. So every gamma can be viewed as a point in CVN by removing, by removing hanging trees and uh, valence 2 vertices. Okay, there might be valence 2 vertices in the middle, um, just like we had yesterday, but just remove those. And then there is a natural length here. I mean, the, the each edge can be assigned length 1, for example. And then these are, and then you can normalize to, have to make the sum equal to 1. Just divide by the volume. So, so in this way, every one of these gamma i's is a point in outer space. And then each fold by itself can be interpreted as a path in outer space because, uh, so a, a fold, gamma i. Oh, what's the marking? Well, the marking comes from the homotopy equivalence to r. All these maps are homotopy equivalences. So they have a homotopy equivalence to r, so the inverse of that is the marking. Okay? A fold, gamma i to gamma i plus 1, can be viewed, can be viewed as, a, as a path in CVN from gamma i to gamma i plus 1. All right, I have some, maybe some kind of a fold here, and I'm, I, I don't have to do it all at once. I can, you know, at time t, I, these have length 1, but at time t I'm just going to fold, uh, you know, by, by t. I'm, I'm going to take the initial piece of length t on each edge and, and glue that, and then I'll have 1 minus t here and 1 minus t here, and so on. So this is this this graph here is this is the time t graph, and as t varies from zero to one, you're interpolating between gamma i and gamma i plus one. Right? This is gamma i, and then gamma i plus one is over here. All right? Does that make sense? So the the folding process gives you a path from the source to the target, and. Uh, well, the last, the last map is uh, some kind of a permutation or, or relabeling or something, but, that's, uh, but those are all isomorphisms. The, the, the stabilizer of R is the sign permutation group. This is what we uh, actually did over here. The, sign permu the stabilizer of the rows with all edges of the same length is the sign permutation group. So you don't have to worry about uh, the, this, you know, this last map could be relabeling and changing orientations and such. But... Um, <clears throat> that doesn't matter. Okay, anyway, that's the, that's the argument. 
So this this folding path really gives you uh, the the folding gives you a path. And if you think about it, the, the path is going to be linear within each simplex. Okay. So this is some of the significance of of the of the folding process that it gives you a way to move around outer space. And later we'll see that. Uh, well, we won't really get to it in these lectures, but um, th there's going to be a metric that we'll discuss next time. And these, these folding paths turn out to be geodesics. Okay, that's why th this is important. Okay, um, now for contractibility, uh, you, you basically, there are several proofs of contractibility. This is not the original proof, but um, the, the idea is to you know, so w when is a space contractible? Well, you need a contraction, so you need a canonical way of, of finding, you know, for any point, you have to join it to the base point by a path, and these paths have to vary continuously as you move the point. So the, the proof is somewhat technical uh, because you, uh, you, have to, you have to control these, uh, these paths. You have, to, you have to show that as you move gamma around, these paths vary continuously. But that's the idea of proof. You know, that's how the proof works. That's how you show contractibility of outer space. Okay. Um, okay, so another thing we'll need is the concept of the spine. And th this is really a, a PL topology concept, so a spine of outer space. So the, the, the action on the space is uh, proper, but it is not co-compact, right? Because I can, I can go to infinity, I can go to one of these missing points, and uh, th that's, um, th there's no way to bring it back by the group action. You cannot, there's no compact subset here, so that any point can be translated into that compact subset. And that's because as you go to this point, you know, you're going to get smaller and smaller loops. And uh, changing the marking will not will not help get rid of small loops. But uh, you, you can, there's, a, <coughs> there's a notion in PL topology that just says that if you, so, there, so every, uh, well, let me just state this. So there is a, uh, oh, uh, the other thing I want to point out is that there are only finitely many orbits of simplices in this picture. Because there are only finitely many shapes of graphs in any given rank. Like here in rank two, you have, uh, you have this shape, you have this shape, and then you have a, ro a rose. That's it. And any two simplices uh, where the, that correspond to graphs of the same shape are going to be in the same orbit. Right? If I take any, any two roses, I can, find, I can find an automorphism that changes the marking of one rose and makes it into the marking of the other rose. Or, or a theta graph. You know, as long as they, they're abstractly homeomorphic, I can find an automorphism that changes the marking of one and transforms it to the marking of the other. So that means that there are only finitely many orbits of simplices. And that's close to being co-compact. I mean, the, the problem with well, the failure of co-compactness is that these simplices are not compact. They're, they have missing phases. But there's a... There's a, a a process in, in just in topology that fixes that. So, um, so the statement here is that there is a uh, um, an equivariant deformation retract K n inside C V n, where the action is co-compact. And, and this PL topology trick is, is just to take the, um, you know, you have the simplex with missing faces, you can form uh, the, the barycentric subdivision. You know, the barycentric subdivision is, uh, is this object, well, I can, right? So this is the barycentric subdivision of the simplex. You have a barycenter of the simplex itself, barycenter of the faces, and then you also have the original vertices. And this gives this for, gives a, a new triangulation of the simplex. But now, just uh, throw away all the simplices in the barycentric subdivision that contain one of the missing uh, faces. So when you do this, you just end up with with this object. Okay. So K n is going to be K n is the union 
of um, a union of simplices in the barycentric subdivision um, of each simplex of each sigma of gamma h uh, that that don't meet um, any missing faces. In other words, they're completely contained in this sigma gamma h. They consist of non-degenerate metrics. So I have to throw away a simplex like this because because it doesn't. Uh, you know, it, it, one of its points is a degenerate metric. Does that make sense? So I I, I have a so in just from topology, th this blue thing is sort of a spine of this um, for simplex with missing faces. There is a canonical deformation retraction. That um, that pushes things from these missing points. You know, I can just push in from these missing points onto the blue, and that's that's completely uh, uh, canonical. So that it's going to be uh, respected by the group action. If I translate this simplex to some other simplex, that's uh, you know this deformation will become deformation on the other simplex. If I take one of the simplices, uh, you know, the, the, this type of a simplex, what is the what is the spine here? Well, it's uh, this is kind of it's going to look funny, but it's just this. So if you if you do this to um, the rank two outer space, then you're going to get a tree inside. Maybe maybe it's time for a different picture of this. So you have a. Right, so the original outer space kind of looks like this, okay, and uh, and then the spine is going to have a little tripod inside each of the two simplices, and this is going to give you a tree, okay, and that's the famous Sayer tree for um, SL2Z, um, and then and then also for these uh, and then these little arcs are going to be glued on. In the middle of every edge, like this. So, so, so strictly speaking, there's going to be an arc sticking out at every one of these points. Okay, that's this is K two. Okay, now what are, what about the dimensions? Okay, so the, the dimension. What is the dimension of outer space? Okay. So I can take I can take a graph with the largest possible number of edges. Well, it turns out the number of edges is three and minus three. If you do a little Euler characteristic calculation, okay. So the, uh, a graph, a trivalent graph of rank n is going to have three n minus three edges. For example, when n is two, uh, the answer is three. Three times two minus three is three, and that's the theta graph for the barbell. So just from from little uh, Euler characteristic, you get uh, that it's three, three n minus three, and then we are normalizing. We are saying sum of the lengths is one. So that means that this is three n minus four. Okay. So you can see that uh, when n is two, you get two, which is correct. When n is three, you get five. So in in rank three, outer space is five dimensional. So we can't really draw this. But what about the spine? Well, maybe that's a little bit uh, harder to see, but it turns out the dimension of, of k n is two n minus three. When n is two, you get one. That's the three. And then when, it, when n is three, you get five. Uh, you get uh, three. So the spine is only three dimensional. So that's better than five, right? It's still too hard to draw. <laughs> okay. So what are some applications of this? Um, okay, so where should I start? Are there any questions? Is this, this part clear so far? The spine? What is a co-compact co action? What is a co-compact action? Uh, so that just means, okay, so an action is co-compact. So G acting on X is co-compact. So this means that uh, there exists some compact space, so compact in X, so that uh, the union of GK over G in G is all of X. So you can translate any point into a specific compact subset. 
Okay, you cannot do that in, in, in the original outer space because of the points that get closer and closer to missing. You know, if you take any compact subset, you can look at the... Well, there's a function that, that to every point in outer space assigns the length of the shortest loop. That's a continuous function. So in any compact subset, it's going to be... Uh, at, you know, the minimum will be attained and it's some positive number. But they, uh, there are all these graphs with, with, that have loops of, uh, they're even smaller. So they, they won't be able to be, you know, to be translated into the compact subset. <coughs> okay. Yes? Uh, no, Kn is not compact, but the action on Kn is co-compact. Because uh, the, the, uh, the intersection of Kn with each simplex is compact. And there are finitely many orbits of simplices. So you give me any point in Kn, well, I can translate it to one of finitely many simplices, but it's still going to end up in the blue. Because the blue is uh, equivariant. And so that's a, so I just take the union of the blues, uh, one, one, I take one blue in every, orb, in, in every represent, representative simplex of every orbit. And that's compact. Okay? Kn is not compact. This is an, it's an infinite tree here. But if I take, if I take this part, just take this, in this case, uh, the, the, you know, this is, a, this is certainly a, a compact set where you can translate everybody. In fact, even just one of these edges is fine. Because there is a, there is a rotation of order 3. You can try to figure out what it is, but uh, there is a rotation of order 3 that fixes this point in the middle and permutes the three edges. So the fundamental domain is actually just this one of these edges. A top dimension in, in outer space? Okay, uh, so you just take some, take some um, graph that, uh, that's trivalent. So for example, uh, this one. This is the tetrahedron. Or there's a track and field. Okay, so they have uh, six edges, and that defines a five-dimensional simplex. Okay, so let me let me now give some consequences. Um, okay, there there is a statement I'll have to postpone for a little bit, but I want to I want to okay. So proposition um, out f n is finitely presented as I said that that was originally proved by Nielsen in 1920s. Uh, so we'll need the following statement. That the kernel of the homomorphism from out fn to... So there is a homomorphism from... Uh, okay, well, I'll, expl I'll explain this. To GLNZ and then to GLN uh, Z mod 3 is torsion-free. See, an element in out fn is an automorphism from fn to fn. Right, so I have phi from fn to fn, and it's an automorphism. What I can do is I can abelianize this whole thing. If I abelianize it, what do I get? I get an automorphism from z to the n to z to the n. Right? Because when you, when you abelianize a free group, you get a free abelian group. And so this is an element of... This is GLNZ. GLNZ is the group of matrices 
n by n matrices with integer entries and determinant 1 or minus 1. So that's exactly the group of automorphisms of Zn. This is really uh, out, or I can say out or ought, it doesn't matter because Zn, Zn is abelian. Right? That gives you this homomorphism. And then I can also reduce from Z to Z mod 3. So this now becomes a finite group. It's a finite group. And the kernel of this uh, a homomorphism has finite index. And uh, so, so this is saying that uh, out fn is virtually torsion free. There is torsion, but if you're willing to pass to a subgroup finite index, you get rid of all the torsion. It also says that any finite subgroup here injects into GLN Z3. So that means that there is a bound. On, you know, not, there, there, aren't, there aren't any very big finite subgroups. They all have to be smaller than the size of this group. Okay, but I don't know if I'll be able to get to that, but let's, let's accept this for now. And let's prove that out fn is finitely presented. Okay, so that's somehow a modern proof of this fact that Nielsen worked out in the 1920s, but he didn't, he didn't have outer space, he didn't, you know, I'm not sure if he, I don't think he knew this either. Okay, so, so what's the strategy of this? So proof. So the strategy is, so how do you, how do you prove that a group is finitely presented? Well, you, you, you get a, a, a free co-compact action on some simply connected space, right? So the strategy is to construct a free co-compact action of out fn on a one connected nice space, polyhedron. I'll just say space, but I mean a nice space. Say x. And so then, uh, because then then out fn is the fundamental group of x mod out fn. And this is now a, a finite a finite complex, compact complex, finite complex, right? But pi one of a finite complex is finitely presented, right? So that's the strategy. That's how you do it in geometric group theory. To prove that the group is finitely presented, you want to construct a free co-compact action of your group on the one connected space. And we have a, a good candidate, namely the spine of outer space. That's co-compact, and the and the spine is simply connected. The only problem is that the action is not free. There are all these finite groups. So, so then there is a trick to, to get rid of these stabilizers. Okay, so there is a, so any, uh, so maybe I'll write that down. So Kn almost works, uh, but there are finite stabilizers. Okay, so to fix this, um, so any, any, finite, any finite group, well, of course, any finite group is finitely presented. You can just write down all the relations. <laughs> um, acts on, uh, acts freely on a compact space. Does everybody know this? So that's a nice little trick. Any finite group acts freely on a compact space. So it's certainly, the action is certainly co-compact because the whole space is compact. But this is, uh, the, the trick is to take the, so any group acts on itself. And th you think of that as, this is now a finite set. Q is a finite group. Now that's not simply connected. It's not even connected. How do you make it connected? Well, you replace Q by the join. Q join Q. This is not a free product, this is just a join of finite sets. Right? If my group is, is say, Z mod 3, then, then uh, the join would give me this utility graph. Right? It would give me the... Yeah. So the Z mod 3 acts on this graph freely. 
How do I make it simply connected? Anybody know? Well, this is the same trick. You know, if you can do it once, you can do it many times. You can do it infinitely many times. <laughs> it's this. Th this construction goes back to Milner. This is called the Milner classifying space. If you if you heard through the words. Anyway, this is a compact space. It's a triple join of uh, of the group, and it's now simply connected. If you want something too connected, then you would add another Q, and so on. Okay. This is a finite complex. If, when Q is Z mod 2, this would be a sphere. This would be the two sphere. Right? You have two points, join two points is a circle. And then if you join with two more points, that gives you, well, you know, I don't know, I can't draw everything, but it gives you a two sphere, right? If you, if you join the circle, two point, you, get, you get a two sphere. And indeed, Z mod 2 acts on the two sphere by the antipodal map. We, and the two sphere is compact and simply connected. So that's how it works in general. Okay. And so now I want I want to apply this uh, construction to Q equal to um, our you know, GLN Z mod three. I want to leave this uh, up for now. <laughs> this calculation. <laughs> um, okay. So. So take Q equal to G L N Z ma three. Okay? So out F N acts on K N cross uh, this Q star Q star Q diagonally. Right? It acts it acts on K N and it also acts on this because it, it maps to it maps to Q. So uh, on the second factor, on the second factor by by um, projecting to Q. Right, out of n maps to Q. Q is this group here. So you have a homomorphism to Q, and then Q acts on this finite complex, and then out of n acts diagonally on this. But now the action is free. Because uh, if I take an element that's, that has infinite order, right, then it doesn't have any fixed points on Kn. And if I take uh, on Kn, right, all, all stabilizers are finite. And if I take a finite order element, well, it will inject into Q. And then it will act freely on the second factor. So there are no fixed points now. We, we got rid of the fixed points by crossing with this uh, compact, simple connected space. And this whole thing is now uh, simple connected because it's a product of two simply connected spaces. And the action is still co-compact, because it was co-compact on Kn, and we crossed with something compact. <coughs> so then, uh, so then x, x equals Kn cross the space works. And that's the end of the proof. Okay. The disadvantage of this method is that we don't have an, an explicit presentation. We don't, we don't know the, but, but just the existence of a finite presentation is easy to, to do from this point of view. And it's not just finite presentation, you can also do higher finiteness. I mean, there, uh, there, there, you know, I won't, I won't really get into it, but you know, there's no reason to stop at one, you know, I, can, I can stick in another queue and keep going, you know, yes. If we explain the action of the Of which? The action of the outer to On the product? Well, so it's, so it's, when I say x diagonally, I mean on each coordinate separately. So if I take, uh, if I take say, phi in, uh, in uh, out fn, right, then the action, let's revert to left actions. <laughs> this is, a, it's going to be less confusing. So let's pretend that the action on kn is on the left. So if I take, uh, so how does phi act on, on the pair, um, let's say x, y? Well, it acts, it acts by acting on, on x, and then by acting on y. And the way it acts on y is by, by, fa by first mapping to, you know, to q, and then the q acts on that. That's what I mean by diagonal action.
Okay. Okay, so that's one application. Let's see. Oh yeah, cohomological dimension. That's a that's a cute application. We'll answer one of the questions that was on the list over there about uh, what's the largest free abelian subgroup. And I think we're just about ready to. So let me just sell cohomological dimension. Okay, so if, if G is a group, um, we'll say, so this is not exactly right, but I want to sim uh, simplify the, the, the discussion. So I won't talk about cohomology. I want to define cohomological dimension without saying the word cohomology. Okay. So that it, it'll be a slight cheat, just warning you. If G is a group, uh, we let CD of G, so this means cohomological dimension. Um, be the smallest integer, say K, such that G acts um, properly and freely on a k-dimensional contractible space. And again, I mean nice space. So like a simplicial complex or a manifold. Um, so what are, what are some, some facts? So, for, so what are or examples? Um, cohomological dimension of Z. This is 1, because Z acts on R, and it's not going to act on something zero-dimensional, properly and freely. More generally, CD of Z to the N is N. Z to the N acts on Rn, freely. Now, you, you, you know, this is where the cheat is. How do you know it's not less than N? You have to use some algebraic topology. Um, for those who, well, maybe maybe everybody knows this. So the, the the point is that if I if I have a so z n is if z n is acting on on x, this is free freely uh, and whatever other words, then uh, then x mod z to the n is homotopy equivalent to the torus. The the quotient of a of a free action on the contractible uh, and x is contractible. The, quotient, the homotopy type of the quotient does not depend on the choice of x, as long as x is contractible and the action is free and, and proper. And so in, in particular, its nth homology is going to be non-trivial. So that means it cannot be less than n-dimensional. So n is the smallest thing you can have here. Okay. Um, if, uh, if H is a subgroup of G, then the cohomological dimension of H is less than or equal in cohomological dimension of G. This is obvious. For any, for any action of G, I can just restrict to H. And then my, maybe I can do even better. Right? Um, what is the cohomological dimension of... of um, of this kernel, kernel of out of n to um, GLNZ, Z3. What can you say about it? We have an action of this on some space, on the spine. And it's free, because this, this is torsion free. So there are no there are no stabilizers. Stabilizers stable are all trivial. So th in other words, this is less than or equal than 2n minus 3. Because that's the dimension of the spine. That's why I left it over there. 
Okay? On the other hand, I claim that um, z to the 2n minus 3 is a subgroup of out of n. Why is that? I don't know if it's really uh, a subgroup of this finite index subgroup, but you can always intersect it. You intersect uh, this z to the minus 3 with the finite index subgroup, you'll get a finite index subgroup of this group, which is then also abstractly z to n minus 3. Okay, so, so why is this true? So th this is true because I can just write it down. Okay, I'll do it in, in rank 3, and then I'll leave it to you to generalize. So for n equals to 3, I, I want to take the following. So a goes to a, b goes to b a to a power k, and c goes to a to the m, c a to the l. So I have three parameters here. So take, take the set of these, S set of these automorphisms where k, m, and l are in z. So that, that's a group, and you can see that when you compose, you get, it's a group, and it's isomorphic to z cubed. And it's a, so it's a subgroup of the automorphism group. So in fact, it's a subgroup of out, because there are no inner automorphisms here, except for the identity. This is why I cannot, you see, I, I, didn't, I didn't put A on the left here, because if I, if I did, then I would pick up some inner automorphisms in this way. Right? If I had A to some power, then I could, by choosing these to be, uh, you know, K and, K and L are equal, and equal to minus M and minus this, whatever this power is, that those would be inner automorphisms. That's why I'm not allowed to put anything here. Okay, so this is not exactly a subgroup of, of this kernel, but if I, if I make K, M, and L all divisible by 3, then, uh, then it will be a subgroup of the kernel, right? You know, in, in, in these matrices, any 3 is then going to be equivalent to 0 in this, in this Z matrix. So, so in fact, z, uh, z to the 2n minus 3 is also a subgroup of, the, of this kernel, out of n to gln z matri. And that means, um, what does that mean? Well, that means that, uh, so this implies that 2n minus 3 is less than or equal than, than the cohomological dimension of the kernel. I should have given a name to that kernel. Right? Because, because of this. Right? If I take a smaller group, then the cohomological dimension can only go down. But the cohomological dimension of, the, of this free abelian group is just the rank. So the, con the conclusion here is that, so the theorem here is that the cohomological dimension of this kernel is exactly equal to 2n minus 3. And, and in particular, the, this out of n does not contain any larger abelian subgroups. This is the largest there is. Right? So the, the rank, the largest rank, the largest rank of a free abelian subgroup in out of n is 2n minus 3. Okay, so this, this is some kind of algebraic statement that we derived in a purely topological way. Questions? Okay, so maybe um, maybe I'll t attempt to prove that this kernel is torsion-free. Unfortunately, this relies on another theorem that we have to state and prove. <laughs> um, if, but if you have questions, then this is probably a good time to ask. Okay, I mean, I, I cannot get to all the details, but I think I, what my, my goal was just to 
to get the to get you the spirit of what the, the subject is like. I mean, you, 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 study, you study spaces like this. This is very topological and geometric, and we'll do more of it next time. Uh, but then, I mean, the ultimate goal is to prove algebraic statements about the group like this. OK. Um, OK, so the, the, what I need is something called the Nielsen realization. Okay, so th this, this has a very uh, long and interesting history. Um, and it's, it's really, th the original formulation is about uh, Teichmuller space, but you can ask the same question in outer space. So the theorem is that, uh, and this was proved also in the 80s by, uh, by several people at the same time. Color, Zimmerman, and I don't remember who the third person. Zimmerman. And I think there was somebody else in the, in the 80s, like 84 or so. Um, every, every finite, I think this, so this was proved before, before outer space was uh, introduced. But the, you know, the modern version of the statement is this. Every finite subgroup of out Fn fixes a point. And in CVN. In other words, all finite subgroups are the ones you see in the model. Any, you know, you, if you look at a point to look at the stabilizer, you'll see a finite subgroup. All finite subgroups arise in this way. There are no mysterious finite subgroups that, that no. There, there are funny examples in topology that you can have a, for example, a cyclic group of order six can act on Euclidean space without a global fixed point. There's no Brouwer's fixed point theorem for. Um, you know, for Z mod six, uh, uh, for Z mod six acting on Euclidean space. So th this is true for prime uh, prime power. So for like Z two and Z three. So this this homeomorphism of order six is going to have p uh, points of, or, uh, of period two and also of period three, but it, it's not going to have a, any fixed points. So this is not automatic, that if you have a finite group acting on some contractible space, that there's always, always a fixed point. So there's something deeper going on. And uh, in, in Teichmuller uh, space, this was also, uh, I mean, it was claimed by somebody in the 50s, and then it turned out to be wrong. And finally, it was proved in, uh, when, late 70s, early 80s, by Steve Krukov. Um, that every finite subgroup of a mapping class fixes a point in Teichmuller space. Okay, so uh, so I want to sketch the proof of this, but it does rely on another theorem of Stallings. Uh, so this is you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> not everything is self-contained unfortunately. So uh, so there is a theorem of of Stallings from the 60s. 1960s, so this is much older, um, and it says the following: that if if gamma is um, is a group uh, that contains F n as a finite index subgroup, then gamma acts on a tree with all stabilizers finite. Well, I, uh, for example, if I take the dihed infinite dihedral group, this is the infinity, right? This is the infinite, this is the group generated by two elements uh, that, that, that both have order two. It's the free product of two z2s. Okay, that group is virtually cyclic. And it acts on it acts on on the line, right? By reflections. So, and the stabilizers are all finite. The stabilizer of a vertex is Z two, and the stabilizer of an edge is trivial. Okay. So this is true for any virtually free group. That's the theorem of Stallings. Actually, his theorem is more general, but this this is the, the version we need. <clears throat> okay. So now a quick uh, quick proof of Nielsen. Nielsen realization. <clears throat> oh, 
OK, so I have the following exact sequence. Um, out of n, and then, no, sorry, out of n. This is the defining exact sequence, if you want, of out of n. Right, out of n was obtained from out of n by mounting out inner automorphisms, and that's fn. <coughs> and then, um, and then I have this uh, finite subgroup. So let uh, let uh, I don't know, h in out of n be a finite subgroup. We want to show that h fixes a point in our in outer space. So I have this uh, defining sequence, and then I have h uh, subgroup of out of n. And I can take the pre-image here, let's say this is P, I can take P inverse of H over here, and then the kernel is also Fn. So I get, I get this kind of a sequence. Right? And now I want to apply the Stallings theorem to this group P inverse of H. This group contains Fn as a subgroup of finite index. See, the quotient is H, which is finite. So Stallings implies that P inverse of H acts on a tree, T, with finite stabilizers. OK, so uh, in, inside this group, I have Fn. How does Fn act on T? Fn is torsion free. So Fn is not going to fix any points. Uh, other than, um, I mean, uh, the identity will, but the, the, so in other words, the action is free. The, the action of Fn is free. So Fn acting on T is free. Okay, so now do you see where we'll get our graph that's going to be fixed? We have an action of Fn on a tree. How do we get a graph out of it? Take the quotient. Okay, so then uh, gamma equals T mod Fn is a graph. Now, it could be that uh, our tree that we picked is not minimal or anything. So it could be that there are little trees hanging, hanging off of that. So just let's ignore that. I mean, if, if, this, if this happens, then remove them. Or replace the original tree by a minimal tree. We don't want any extra stuff here. So this is a graph, and if you do it correctly, it'll be it'll be a nice little graph like this. I mean, there won't be any any crazy things hanging off. But uh, <coughs> Fn is a normal subgroup here. So if you if you think about this, the, you know H H will continue to act on on this quotient, right? If, if you have a, a normal su so you have a group acting on the space, and you have a normal subgroup of the group. Well, when you mod out by the normal subgroup. The quotient still, uh, the, quo the quotient group continues to act on the quotient space. Okay, so this is the, uh, and, uh, so and, and the quotient, um, P inverse H mod Fn, which is of course H, continues to act, to act on this graph, on gamma, by isometries. If you if you take the simplicial metric, so there, there there are edges here, so you can just declare all edges to have the same length, and that's it. So so we found the graph, and and this group is acting by isometries by the symmetries of this graph. So that means it fixes that point in outer space. That's it. Yeah, no, no, no proof. It's magic. Okay. So th this is somehow much easier than what happens in Teichmuller space, and and it's also maybe slightly uh, n n the proof is not completely satisfying because it, it somehow goes it, it doesn't use the geometry of outer space it somehow uses some some external magic. And uh, any questions? Why is the action of the free group on T is free? 
so the, the action of the whole group has finite stabilizers. And, and if I take a torsion-free subgroup, then no non-trivial element can fix anything there because it would, it, you know, every element, every non-trivial element has infinite order. If it fixed the point, the stabilizer would be infinite. This is just like the, you know, this, the, the kernel here. The kernel of this map to GLN Z mod 3 is acting freely on outer space for the same reason, because it's torsion-free. If you take a torsion-free subgroup of a group that's acting with finite stabilizers, then the action of the subgroup has to be free. Cannot have any stabilizers. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's too much stuff. I, I was going to also outline why why the kernel is torsion free, but maybe that's too much, huh? I don't know whether I guess something. So the, okay. So the, you, you were saying the gamma number should fix point in a fixed point. Yes. Uh, what do you know? Even considering the marking. So so we we had this proposition that said that the stabilizer is isomorphic to the stabilizer of a. So here I'm putting the lengths that they're induced by the by the simplicial structure. So there are some, there are some edges here, right? Yeah, and then I just take, I put uh, the same length on every edge. So now the action here is by isometries. And we had this lemma that the stabilizer of a point is isomorphic to the uh, symmetry group of the graph. So here I realized uh, H as the symmetry group of a graph. So that means that the that H is going to fix the corresponding point there. Th this actually comes with a marking. You know, this gamma comes with a marking because um, because it comes from the the, the quotient of the, the quotient of a contractible space by F n. So you, you have a canonical identification of pi one of gamma with F n. So this does define a point in outer space. So does it fix a unique point or? No, no, no. Uh, so, in, like for example, this uh, reflection here. Let's fix the whole line. It's not unique. Right. So, why do you not that, that garbage outside of some, you, know, you have some tree? Yeah, so, that, so it could be that you started with uh, the tree that wasn't minimal. There is a, a, a subtree which is invariant. And then, and then the quotient would look like this. It would, you know, mem yeah, like this. But you can just remove that. You know, the, 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 this. I mean, the, the H H is acting by isometries here. So if you remove trees, it's still acting by isometries. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to go through it. But now you can, you know, from Nielsen realization, you can, uh, the, the, what, to see that this kernel is torsion free, what, what, I mean, the statement that, uh, maybe I'll just say it as an exercise, that if you have a, a phi from, this is a more general version of what I already stated as an exercise. If, if phi from gamma to gamma is an isometry, and, uh, and, and the action in the, in the homology with z, z ma three coefficients, is identity. Then, uh, then phi is equal to the identity. Yeah, before I said if, if phi is homotopic to the identity, but this is more general. If it's acting as the identity in the Zima three homology, then uh, then it is identity already. That's what you need to to prove to to see that this kernel is. Uh, so the point is, if you take some finite order element in the kernel, it will have to act as the symmetry of a graph by Nielsen. And it will also have to be trivial in Zima 3 homology, because it's in the kernel. And then from this exercise, it's identity. So there are no, uh, so the kernel is torsion free. And, uh, I mean, here, the, maybe the hint is that if you take any loop in the graph, so you have some kind of a complicated graph, take any loop like this, where can this loop go? It, the loop defines a cycle. 
Ma tree. And it has to be sent to itself by this assumption. So the, the circle actually has to be sent to itself. And in fact, it's Zima 3 and not Zima 2, so the, in fact the orientation is preserved. So it can only get rotated. So every circle you see in the picture can only be rotated. But if I take two circles, like this one and this one, uh, then you see that there can't be any rotation because they, uh, you know, the overlap has to be preserved as well. And so you, you see that it has to be identity. Anyway, that was just a little hint for this, but some arguments like this. If it's if you put Z mod two, then it's not quite true because you could be flipping the, um, you know, like in the rows, you can you can flip a circle over, and that will be identity in Z mod two homology, but it's not identity. Okay, so this is uh, this is the end of today. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>